So um, let's start. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Jim Overson. So some of us uh, already know Jim quite well. For those of you who don't, uh, Jim received his PhD in physics at UPenn about 10 years ago. So then he spent some time at the city in Santa Barbara, not too far from here, moved to Boston, where he uh, became professor at Northeastern University, and he still is there. So Jim is uh, very well known in the Trinity community, so he received uh, NSF career award and uh, then quickly transitioned to physics and uh, AI. And um, now Jim is uh, co-PI and also a board member of uh, one of the first NSF AI institutes, NSF Institute for Artificial Intelligence and Fundamental Interaction. So, Part of the reason uh, he is here is uh, that this week, as some of you know, we run back-to-back uh, -back two conferences, one is machine learning and mathematics, that are spin data. Spin data already has a very long seven-year history of interaction between string theory, data science, and uh, uh, Jim is uh, one of the founding fathers, and uh, together with me, and uh, you're also a good organizer of this year's conference. So uh, hopefully in the start, he'll present us a glimpse of uh, kinds of interactions that are happening at these meetings, and it's quite better to All right. Thank you for the excellent introduction. It's an honor to be here. In advance, I am happily COVID negative, but unfortunately COVID positive. So uh, I hope that that doesn't affect uh, the communication. I will unmute my mic so people can hear me. Uh, but if you need me to speak up or more clearly, just let me know. So uh, it's wonderful to be here. I'm going to tell you about a uh, line of work that has been happening over the last years, which I broadly dubbed deep learning for theory. One of the themes is going to be that sort of as we go more and more towards theory, uh, rigor becomes more and more important. And uh, the one of the main points of the talk is already sort of here on the title slide. How many of you think I do this? How many of you think GPT do this? Okay, only half of you raise your hands. So this is this is a GPT generated prompt. Uh, I said something like taco stands, Los Angeles, surfer by the beach, or something like that, and it gave me this. And so what this talk is about is, on one hand, these techniques are incredibly powerful. Uh, I was riding the bus home one day, I think it was, did a couple of prompts back and forth, and ended up with this, which is really impressive. But upon a little closer scrutiny, there's some strange things in this photo. So for example. This surfer looks like he's gonna crash into the wall. He's going far too fast. These planes are not at a safe distance. And I was a little surprised. I asked, I went back and looked, I asked for a taco stand, not a taco truck. But it interpreted taco truck right here in a very different way, in a very different way than what we mean by a taco truck. And you can see how a, a, a large language model that knows about tacos and knows about trucks might interpret taco truck in this way and that seems to be what's happening. So what's happening at this meeting here this week, these two meetings, one is on machine learning and mathematics and the other is on string data. These are two communities of people that are taking machine learning and artificial intelligence very seriously in the context of math and theoretical physics. We're uh, a community of people that is mixed here at the Mixer lunch yesterday, which was very successful. And uh, we're people that are uh, trying to think about how do we do rigor? in the context of, of uh, AI and applying it to math and physics. Uh, some of my friends and I in Boston are sort of, that are part of this meeting are on sort of the theoretical end of the spectrum of the NSF AI Institute for Artificial Intelligence and Fundamental Interactions. What we're doing is advancing physics knowledge from the smallest building blocks of nature to the largest structures in the universe and hopefully galvanizing AI research innovation in the process. Uh, you can see over here some uh, some model of the model of the proton with the red, the green, and the blue, and we have I5 fellows that are sort of the gluons that mediate strong interaction between our institute. We're hiring three or four people every year, depending on this. And if you're interested in the things that I say in this talk, I strongly encourage you to apply next year. This year's application deadline has passed, but this is something that we're doing every year, and we're really excited about it. Our fellows are playing a really important role in gluing together the institute. So, given that I'm here at Caltech. I thought it was apropos to, especially in this lecture hall, to try to get some image of Feynman 
Uh, and, you know, he might say AI and physics, it's like teaching a parrot to recite Shakespeare. It might sound profound, but does it understand the sonnets? You need bigger, not just clever mimicry. Of course, this is something that was also uh, GPT generated, and I promise I'll stop with the GPT at some point. Uh, but getting this image was also GPT generated. Again, it's impressive, but there's some failure modes in the process of producing this that I arrived at. So I, I prompted, I said, I want a bold comic book close up of Richard Feynman expressing excitement about AI, but skepticism about its uses in physics. And because I do widescreen slides, I told him widescreen. And it gave me this. <laughs> It gave me this, okay, so like, could be worse, could be better. It looks a little too goofy. So I tried again, I said a little less clownish, and then I realized I wanted to put some words in his mouth. So I said, give me an empty quote bubble coming out of his mouth that I can fill in. And it comes up with this, okay, that looks interesting. Um, one thing that you notice here is that this is kind of a weird feature. It, I guess it's supposed to be whiskers, but it looks more like a milk mustache to me. <laughs> So I said, no milk mustache on the please. Use Caltech colors. And it gives me this. And it interpreted me saying no milk mustache and saying, I want an actual mustache. Which maybe I've only, I haven't seen enough pictures of Biden, but I don't recall seeing a picture of Biden with an actual mustache. It's not really his look. It's a good so, picture. Pardon? It's a good picture. There's a good picture up there, no mustache. There's another one over here, no mustache. But this one, you know, he sort of went the wrong direction. So I said, no mustache. And uh, what it produces is this, an updated picture of Feynman, this time without a mustache, even though... So you sort of get the point, and I say, he has a huge mustache in that picture. And it tries again, and still demands that it's depicted without a mustache. Large language models are amazing. They're uh, one of the easiest things to produce awesome stuff with, with uh, machine learning. They're also incredibly error prone. They're one of the easiest things to break. This was not me fine tuning it to get it to screw up. I was, it was either late one night randomly after, you know, near bedtime or on the bus. I forget which it was. I did the free time I play around with this sometimes. And it produced awesome stuff, but it also produced obvious failure modes. And so uh, what we want to think about in this talk is, you know, other, rather than giving up, which is sort of a natural thing, we want to sort of think about rigor in machine learning and its applications in physics. And how do we go from these seemingly seemingly error prone, but obviously very powerful techniques to do things in theoretical physics and pure math. So being a little more technical, I know nothing GPTs about. Uh, there's something in machine learning that uh, called generalization error that makes this point very clear. When you train an ML algorithm, typically you train it on some data, and then you test it on some data that wasn't seen in uh, the training process. So this training loss is on, it, on the training data, there's some measure of badness of fit called loss, and this going down is good, but when it when it is tested on data that it hasn't seen, it's sort of this gap sort of creates right here. And one of the big things in machine learning theory is to try to understand this gap and how to close it. There's also another feature that in this model complexity axis, this thing actually turns over in an interesting way. But intrinsic to this is the fact that there's error under the hood. It's just part of the system. And if we're gonna do math and physics, you better learn how to mitigate that. There's also something famous called an adversarial attack. This is a very famous example from 2014, which by ML standards now is ancient. So a convolutional network was trained uh, to do image classification. The network was 57.7% confident that this was a panda. So noise was added on top, literally some noise on top that produced this image. And the network became 99.3% confident that it's a human. Okay. So this is called an adversarial attack. These are just examples. There's many things like this in machine learning where you have powerful techniques that nevertheless are error prone and you'd like to learn how to mitigate. So if we talk about rigor, we should say, what do we mean by rigor? What we definitely don't mean, no one in science means uncontrolled approximations. That's often what's happening in machine learning is that it seems to be doing well, but we really don't have any control over the approximation. Doing slightly better is controlled approximations. That is, Situations in ML or more generally numerical techniques where you have controllable error bars, and if you collect more statistics or do a better job, you can sort of systematically predict how you're going to beat down the error bars and do better. But this is not what people in the ML for math meeting or in the string data meeting mean by rigor. What we really mean is there's no approximations, there's no error, it's just some exact calculation. So can you do this type of science with them? That's the point of this talk. So how should we frame this? 
First of all, maybe I should tell you at the outset that uh, this sort of thinking is still a work in progress in the community. So there's no surefire one way to go. Uh, the best that I can do is show you a couple of different approaches for how people do this in a couple of different scientific contexts. So I'm hoping that on the science axis, I can access, I can introduce introduce some concepts to you and interest you in some of those. And on the bigger axis, I'll give you a couple of techniques for thinking about this. But if at any point you find yourself losing attention during the talk, I promise I will change to a different subject in a few minutes. So if we frame vigor with ML, uh, one of the most obvious things you might do is take some way to do apply machine learning and make it vigorous. Another thing that you can do, this was pretty clear pretty early on in the community. Another thing that you do is might find places where machine learning theory is actually relevant to theoretical physics or mathematics. And if you're doing theory, you have the normal theory notions of rigor because you're doing calculations, you're not just applying an algorithm. Okay. So the outline of my talk is the following. First, I'm going to tell you about rigor from applied ML. I'm going to tell you about something called conjecture generation that's going to lead to new theorems and strings and knots. I'm actually going to say almost nothing about string theory in this talk in the interest of being broad. I'm going to tell you then about something called we call rigorous verification. I want a better name than this, so please suggest them. But what I'll what I'll do is I'll use ML to establish some exact properties of knots and to attack the 40 Poincaré conjecture, the smooth version of it, which is still open. Then I'll switch gears and instead of talking about rigor with applied ML, making applied ML rigorous, I'll just talk about how ML theory interfaces with these subjects. I'll review some of the current currently what's known about the theory of neural network statistics. And I'll claim that this gives a new approach to field theory. And finally, I'll uh, I'll turn to a theory of neural network dynamics and explain how that gives a theory of geometric flows building on some of the empirical work that's been done in the literature. This encompasses some famous examples like Perelman's formulation of the chief. Okay. My cold is affecting me a little more than I thought, but tip of one a lot. So let's begin with rigor from the planet. So I'll begin with conjecture generation for string theory and not theory. Oh, that's right. Good. This was actually my path into ML. This was uh, something I was, you read a paper years later, you might not still be proud of it. I'm proud uh, of aspects of this paper, but especially this little bit that through conjecture generation, machine learning is useful for numerics, not only useful for numerics, but also for rigorous results. Uh, there's big data in string theory. Uh, there's a certain type of geometry that is known to be finite. This is an algebraic geometry group from 2016, but it's known that the number of topological types of that thing is at least 10 to the 755. Um, you know, the, the physics of this theorem isn't particularly uh, relevant to a broad audience, but what is of interest to a broad audience is sort of this basic idea of conjecture generation, which is the following. Use machine learning, for example, something called supervised machine learning. That's the type of thing that might label images as pandas or dogs or cats or something like that. It'll be generally error prone in some way. But if you open the box, and we'll talk about different ways that that might be done, you might discover that there are key decision variables. And then the crucial thing is that if you can bring a human expert into the loop, that you can interpret the results, you might realize that there's some sort of correlation going on in the data, going on in the problem that might lead to a conjecture such that you can iterate and double theorem. Uh, this is something that's been happening in our community in a number of papers. There's actually more than I've listed here um, since about 2017. Um, and, and, uh, but I'm only going to talk about one really famous example. Um, and that's in knot theory. So let me explain knot theory in a nutshell. I have a couple of knots here. Is the knot representative topologically trivial? Is a fundamental question. What that means, if it's topologically trivial, you can untwist it into a circle without ripping or tearing. Who thinks this one's trivial? Your mind's eye can do it. Who thinks this one's trivial? Good. So this one's not trivial, and this one uh, is trivial, and it's kind of easy to tell. But if I give you partner knots, who thinks this one's trivial? Who thinks that one's trivial? Okay, good. So this one is trivial, and that one's not trivial, but it's much harder to tell as the number of process goes up. So this is the famous unknot problem in knot theory, and it's one of the ones we studied with ML. I'll tell you mostly about another one today, though. But this is sort of an introduction to the basic idea. A knot is an S1 that's smoothly embedded in S3. There's an infinite number of so-called planar projections that yield images such as these. And the number of uh, overs and unders here is called the number of crossings. And there's a theorem that's due to Reitermeister that two planar projections are the same knot if and only if they're related by Reitermeister moves. 
So there's uh, this type of randomized you move here that you can apply on this little region to untwist this little bit. And then uh, there's two other types of randomized your moves. And so if you can apply a sequence of these randomized your moves to a knot to simplify it to a simple, you can demonstrate the move. So you can imagine gamifying that a little bit and allowing the moves of the game to be these randomized your moves. And then the object of the game is to find the sequence of moves that uh, trivializes the knot. Of course, not topological invariants are ones that don't change with these moves because when you change the, when you act with these, you don't change the topological type of the knot. So those are invariants. So this is not not theory in a nutshell. So even though some of our original interest was in this string theory, there's a really beautiful work by DeepMind in 2021, a few years later, um, that did some uh, conjecture generation of theorem proving in knot theory. And so uh, what they did is basically the following. First of all, they studied a bunch of knots and they computed some topological invariants. There's something called the hyperbolic volume of the knot. There's something called the meridional translation. There's something called the signature. There's something very famous in physics called the Jones polynomial. And uh, these are things that don't change under the randomized moves. These are fundamental properties of knots uh, that do not change under these sorts of deformations. So what they were interested in was whether they could get at new theorems given the data that they had using machine learning. So they applied this idea of conjecture generation to predict the knot signature, this one, from other geometric invariants of the knots that are here on the left-hand side. They had a machine learning algorithm that was getting something like 95% accuracy predicting the signature, and then they asked the question, which of these variables that input are most important? So the way that they did it was something that they, that's called gradient saliency. So the neural network that's making the prediction is F. X is this list of topological invariants that gets fed in. And all they're asking is, how much does the prediction of the neural network change under some small fluctuation under the highest topological invariant that's being fed in? And by doing that, they can basically determine some sort of importance score for which topological invariants affect the prediction the most, that's actually what this x axis is here, the normalized attribution score. They realize that some of the invariants basically don't matter at all, whereas others of the invariants do matter a lot. Okay. So if you hand this to a mathematician, they then say, okay, well, for some reason, the uh, meridional and longitudinal translation are very important for the signature. And that could lead to some clever thought and some conjecture. And what they did was they worked with some topologists and they wrote down a theorem that relates this thing called the slope and an injectivity radius and this hyperbolic volume to the signature in this way. So this is an example of a situation where there was an ML algorithm that was doing pretty well, but literally had error. And by bringing the human expert into the loop and doing some interpretable ML, they were able to break down the conjecture. That's the first of the topics in taking applied ML and making it rigorous. I want to tell you one other, and maybe I'll take a pause at the midpoint of the talk to see if there are any questions. If there are any urgent questions, please interrupt me throughout. The second is the following. Sorry? Yes. Did, did they prove this inequality? They did prove it. It's a theorem. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that was exactly the idea. They proved it. Okay. They do use a kind of way to prove it. They just use it to get the conjecture and then standard analytic techniques to. That, that's exactly right. What you suggested is another thing that people do. Uh, they didn't do this here. This was ML that gives intuition to a human that tells them what's important, and then they write down the conjecture. Right. <laughs> Any other questions? Maybe this one. I know it's kind of obvious, but it's good. Yes. It's a big jump to go from, yeah, that those quantities are relevant to writing down the exact point. Their paper discusses this. I actually forget. Um, there was some sort of case in this sort of process of going from Things like a normalized attribution score through a conjecture. There's some thinking involved, there's some testing. Uh, there was some aspect of their problem that involved some sort of sample bias in the data that was leading them astray. And so they had to like refine how they were thinking about the knots and how they were sampling the knots. There's definitely ways to go wrong. And part of the art is exactly how you go from this to the conjecture of the chain. It's definitely not true. This is one type of thing conjecture here. Let's take another way to make applied ML rigorous. This is something that I'll call rigorous verification. Again, you want another name for this. And it's related to the Poincare conjecture. We use something called reinforcement learning, which also has a number of string theory applications that people in the audience have found. Reinforcement learning is the type of machine learning, unlike supervised learning, which was used here. Supervised learning is take these invariants and predict the signature. Reinforcement learning is basically about the game. If you've heard of alpha go and alpha zero, the type of machine learning used there is called reinforcement learning. And the basic idea is that you have some agent that's exploring a state space, 
And as it explores the state space, there's a policy function that maps states to actions. So the, the agent sees a state and then it predicts what action it should take. And as it explores the system by this policy function, by a, by a um, sort of stochastically rolling out and following this policy, it collects rewards. There's notion of goodness and badness for states. And what the way that it works is it basically takes this reward and it learns how to backpropagate it to update its policy function so that the policy leads to better behavior over time. It's related to, uh, sorry, I'm gonna, we're going to apply it to the Poincaré conjecture. So the Poincaré conjecture is a classic conjecture in geometrical in geometric topology. Uh, the, basically, the, the, the question is, is a sphere-like object actually a sphere? There's two slight refinements that I should introduce. One is the topological version. So is a, is a closed, simply connected D-manifold homeomorphic to a D-sphere? Basically, this is just a statement uh, of whether something with some simpler topological properties really guarantees that it's topologically equivalent to a D-sphere. There's also something called the smooth version of it, which says if a D-manifold is homeomorphic to the D-sphere, if it topologically really is the D-sphere, is it also diffeomorphic to it? Is there a smooth and vertical map to take it to the so there are these two versions of the Poincaré conjecture. There's more actually, but I'll, I'll stick to, to these. And it depends on whether you're considering topological or smooth, and it depends on the dimension that you're considering also. So there's some old history uh, behind this. Uh, Snell got uh, uh, the topological version is true in dimensions d greater than or equal to five, and he received the Fields Medal. Uh, Mike Friedman famously in the 80s proved that the topological version is true in four dimensions and received the Fields Medal. Also famously, Perelman uh, in 2003 showed that both the topological version and the smooth version are true in three dimensions. He famously was offered the field metal and declined it. Uh, but interestingly, in, in low dimensions, the only one that's open is the smooth version of four dimensions. And this is what we call SPC4. So SPC4, coming back to what the definitions are, is basically just a question of whether a D manifold that topologically is equivalent to a four sphere is actually smooth and equivalent. So this is just a fundamental question in geometric topology, and this is one of this, these very old conjectures in geometric topology that's still open. Interestingly, there's a large list of potential counterexamples. So let me explain to you a little bit about uh, uh, this version of the problem. So I told you about random isogenes, which are these twistings of these knots that allow you to uh, generate topologically equivalent representatives. I need to introduce one more type of group, and it's called band division. So can look at a knot of this type. It's so much easier to explain than string theory. And a band addition works like this. It basically takes two little intervals on a knot and like inserts a band between them. So this is the band right here. And you can see when I take this knot and I do a band addition, notably band additions do not give you topologically equivalent knots. They change the topology. But uh, this band addition here lets me untangle this object into two circles that are disconnected. These are unlinked unknots. So I had one band addition that gave rise to two unlinked unknots. So this is actually has a name. This is called a ribbon knot. A ribbon is a knot that you can think of uh, where you get this trivial link, these unlinked unknots, by joining k components of a knot with k minus one band. So this is one component joined with one. Uh, this is one. I might have the numbers wrong. This is one component joined with one band, and it gives me. Uh, Oh, I'm sorry. That's right. This definition runs the video in first. So these are two link components that I can join together by one band and produce this. So the result, uh, uh, one result of band additions is that a, a, a knot is ribbon if and only if it bounds a ribbon disk in 3D. So you can see that there's this way of filling in this knot such that you get sort of this disk that self-intersects in this particular way with sufficiently mild singularities. And uh, Okay. It's getting a little technical, but there's also something called sliceness, where you can take this object and sort of stretch it out into four dimensions. Uh, a knot is sliced if it bounds a smooth disk in four dimensions, and in particular, if a knot's ribbon, it implies that it's sliced. So this is some technical aspects of knot theory, but basically, you should just think of this as these little twists and turns I can do on a knot that could be topologically equivalent ones. What I can also do is add a move to the game where I do this band addition, and this is related to a property called ribbonness. There's this nice picture that illustrates it here. So this, it turns out, is related to the smooth Poincaré conjecture in four dimensions. Uh, I won't explain all of this. I'll just tell you the logic. Uh, mathematicians produce pairs of knots, K1 and K2, that satisfy a property called having the same zero series. So this is some topological thing that mathematicians study. And there's this interesting aspect of uh, such knots. If two knots have the same zero surgery, 
And one of them is slice, and one of them is not slice. You do these very concrete topological things that you can check. But there's a way to take those objects and build them into higher dimensional manifolds and construct something called an exotic force sphere. So an exotic force sphere is a force sphere that would be topologically equivalent to a force sphere, but not the like, you know, not smoothly equivalent to it. And if this is the case, then the smooth quad gray conjecture will imagine these false. Okay. So what our idea was, was to use machine learning to get uh, an algorithm that could demonstrate this ribbon in this property by a, some type of game where I try to do uh, randomized removes and add bands to try to get the unlinked in this way. And if you could do that and demonstrate that something is ribbon, and you could show uh, that the other knot in the pair is, uh, is not sliced, then you would be able to disprove this conjecture. Of course, I would be giving an entire colloquium on that if we had disproved the quantum conjecture of this new version of four dimensions. But I want to tell you a little bit about uh, how this goes. So the first iteration of this project was a paper from 2010 where we have the unknot game. The unknot game has states that are braid representations of a knot. I just represented them as knots here, but we use braid representations uh, in the uh, in, in, in the product. One way to think of that is there's ways to like slice this knot and stretch it out so that it looks like a braid instead of a knot. Uh, and we have the actions in this game. So we have some state space that we're exploring. We have some actions that are these randomized removes. And basically what we were able to see is that compared to a random walker just randomly doing randomized removes, uh, the, these reinforcement learning algorithms were much better at demonstrating that a knot was topologically trivial than what random walker was. That's not the game that's of interest for, that's not the game that is of interest for uh, us in this talk primarily. Instead, what we did was we took this version of the game and we amplified it by adding this extra move, this band addition, where I add a band and I untangle. And by adding that move, I have states that are knots. The actions are those from the unknot game plus band additions. And what we ended up with is uh, a state of the art ribbon solver that um, is able to, again, do these moves. And if it can simplify it to this unlinked unknot, this collection of circles, you have rigorously demonstrated no error that the knot is ribbon. Okay. Maybe if you're not as concerned about not theory, this is the sort of thing that you can regularly do to apply machine learning in, in, in physics or in math. If you can somehow gamify your system, so there's some sequence of moves where you're trying to do something useful, uh, you can you can get rigorous results. So one of the main results is that we ruled out over 800 potential counterexamples to the smooth one gray conjecture of the number dimensions by demonstrating that both knots are ribbon. Okay. So just in conclusion, the smooth uh, 40 quad gray conjecture is still a conjecture. In principle, though, it could be disproven by our ribbon verifier combined with topological structure statistics. So um, this is an honest attempt on the quad gray conjecture. We did not succeed. It may be that we didn't succeed because it's true. The conjecture is true. We'll never find a counterexample, but we were able to rule out many different ones. So this ends the part of my talk on uh, applied ML. I have the one type of way of making a five ML rigorous where I did conjecture generation and I brought a human into the loop. We did interpretable AI and uh, that human looks at precision variables that are useful for making predictions with the neural network and they write down a conjecture and prove it theorem via an iterative process. I also showed you rigorous verification by which I mean find some way of gamifying the problem that you care about. You have some state space that you're trying to explore. You have some set of actions that are natural to do and you can sort of figure out how to uh, the, the algorithm learns how to intelligently sort of run the plot forward and do something useful. And if it's able to establish the property, it's doing it rigorously because it's doing it in a space where all of the moves are important. So those are the two basic ideas. This is a good time to pause for questions. I don't like you guys. I don't like you. What is the second example related to the Poincaré conjecture? Yeah. Do you have to, this is a very nice question. Do you have to write the, like this type of the machine learning code or can you take known codes and sort of apply them to the problem that you're studying? That is a great question. Um, in applying any of these techniques anywhere in that one thing you almost always have to do is do something called define the environment, which is to have some sort of code implementation of the state space and then the set of actions in it. So some data representation of knots and some uh, some subroutines that are carrying out the actions on the data. 
That's something you basically always have to do because probably you're applying it for the first time to somebody in some people. At that point, you can choose to code up other people's algorithms yourself, come up with your own algorithms, or what we typically do in practice is that reinforcement learning is a whole field in deep learning. It's what algorithm, it's what we find used to beat go and chess. And as a rule of thumb, it's you know, unless you really have a lot of confidence in your own abilities, it's better to use known implementations. So in these projects, we coded the environment ourselves, but then we plugged it into the reinforcement learning algorithms that uh, were coded by other people. Thank you for the question. So let's let's switch gears a little bit. Um, this is the subject that when I started doing this in 2017, I really didn't see and anticipate at all. And uh, there's actually quite a number of talks on connection at this meeting, string data, between connections between ML theory, theoretical physics, or physics ways of understanding ML theory. And this is a field that I think is just going to keep growing and is really exciting. So all I really want to do is review some of the basics of neural network statistics and some of the basics of neural network dynamics and tell you how that relates to field theory and to geometry. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about field theories and neural networks. It's a new approach to field theory with a different statistical origin. It relies on this progress in neural network statistics. But I should really explain what a neural network is. So <laughs> computer scientists might really uh, not like this definition. This is how a physicist thinks about it. A neural network is a function with parameters in it. Okay? And it's typically a big function, by which I mean there's little tiny functions and it composes the little functions into a big function. Big might mean if you try to write it down on a piece of paper, it would take many pages. And uh, it has many, many parameters. Therefore, it's some sort of map from parameter space to function space. Uh, the parameters, when you start the neural network on your computer, it has to pick some initial condition for the point in parameter space that it starts at. Particular numbers plugged into the parameters. And it does that by drawing the parameters from some sort of distribution and if you'd like, if, the, if this structure of the function that's called the architecture determines a map from parameters to function space, the choice of a parameter distribution puts statistics on the parameter space, and therefore, by, by this architecture map, this, this map that involves this function that involves these parameters, it puts statistics on the function space as well. And what I'll try to convince you is that this is sort of the essence of what a field theory is, and that this is a different way to think about field theory. But I won't go there yet. So state-of-the-art neural networks have trillions of parameters and they cost millions of dollars to train. I showed you on the title slide, I mean, I did something dumb like give me tacos and servers in Los Angeles or something like that. And it produced something that is really impressive to take a sentence or two of text and produce an image like that. These are not trivial functions. It is a function, but it is a function with trillions of parameters and it costs a lot to train. That's why this is such a big industry right now. But the basic idea is still that we just have some parameterized function and we're updating, updating just means changing the parameters to do some sort of goal. And one of the simplest forms of these functions is, which is from 1954, I think, it's called the perceptron. And this is the building block for what is called a deep feed forward neural network. And so in this setup, f of x is just by neural network. It's some function of inputs that could be images or grades or whatever it may be in your domain application. And uh, b, B0 and B1 are a vector of parameters, and W0 and W1 are matrices of parameters. So basic, and sigma is what's called an element-wise nonlinearity. So basically, this is just some function where some input to the neural network undergoes some matrix multiplication and some shift. Alternatively, if you prefer, this is just an affine transformation of X. And then some nonlinearity acts element-wise on this vector. And then in this case, I do it again where I have Another app, I take this output here, this vector here, and I do another app by transformation by matrix multiplying W1 and shifting by vector V1. And as I said, <coughs> these parameters, when you start your neural network on a computer, come from somewhere. So V0 and V1 are sampled from some normal distribution, and W0 and W1 are sampled from another normal distribution with some slightly different normalizations. But in the end, this thing is just some parameterized function and all of the things that are happening in the are increasingly complicated, big parameterized functions that can do cool things. Even this simple architecture, though, has something called the universal approximation theorem, which basically uh, the essence of it is that if you have some crazy function 
And the, the dimension here of this vector is called the width of the network. So this is some vector of width of uh, dimension n that's called the width. And so as you increase the width, uh, there's ways to argue that you can have more and more steps. Uh, red is the neural network, blue is the function that you're trying to approximate. And as you increase n, you have little more and more steps that you can use to approximate this function. And the essence of these theorems, and there's different versions of them, is that under certain assumptions, you can approximate any theorem to an error of size one over n. So as you make n bigger, as you make the network wider and wider and wider, n is the width, what you end up with is a situation where you can approximate. So this is the in principle why of why this is a good idea, because functions are appearing everywhere in mountain physics, and these are universal approximators. As I said, the architecture is how you stitch these functions together in a bigger function. Uh, the convolutional neural network is uh, one that's good for image data. It's a certain type of architecture. It's good with local features such as the Eiffel Tower. This is the title slide of the talk I gave in Paris two weeks ago. The transformer is the architecture uh, that is used in large language models like GPT. This is a paper called Attention is All You Need from 2017 that has more citations in five years than I think every paper in biology theory combined. Um, so this is a very big community with a lot of research going on. This paper I think already has over 100,000 citations. So this is a very large community compared to the community I live in. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about how we think theoretically about neural networks. So a neural network is just some parameterized function. And we want to uh, not worry about practical things for a minute. We just want to ask, what would we want to do in principle? So if you have some initial neural network before training, and it's given some image or some grade or something called that x, the neural network is just a function that predicts f of x, which could be some topological invariant, it could be whether it's a cat or a dog, and so on and so forth. But we know that the neural network f of x, we want to actually train it as well, so that given x, it predicts f sub t of x, which is a, the, the, the time-dependent function. As I'm updating the parameters, presumably it's getting better and better at making predictions. But this also still is not good enough. And the reason is, is that when you think of it this way of having your neural network that depends on training time t, this is still from some initial parameter value. And that initial parameter value is literally an arbitrary draw from some parameter density, from some distribution of parameters. So really theoretically, what you would want is an ensemble of neural networks and you would want some uh, training time dependent expectation across all random initializations. But this actually is some expectation value that's time dependent under training time as it evolves of some infinite ensemble of functions. And in field theory, we just call this the one function. So if you follow this all the way to convergence uh, of the training, it gets the, the neural network gets better and better and better at making predictions over time. T goes to infinity, it's making very good predictions. This is just saying that you want to compute a mean prediction, one point function of balance. Similarly, you can think about uncertainty. The reason that I introduced this isn't just the theoretical question, what would you want to do if you didn't have compute limitations? It's also that this one-point function and two-point function actually play a critical role in neural network theory. Um, so if this neural network that I have on the previous page, I, I turned off these bias vectors. So this is just some input that gets multiplied by some weight matrix. And then I have a nonlinearity acting on this vector. And then I have another weight matrix. This gives me this function f of x. There's a famous result in the Neil from the 1990s that basically works the following. What I'm doing here is that I'm summing up a bunch of things, and you can think about it for a little while and realize that under certain assumptions, those bunch of things you're summing up are independently and identically distributed. Which if you remember from your statistics course, these are the conditions of the central limit theorem. And what the central limit theorem tells you is that if you sum up a bunch of IID stuff, independently and identically distributed stuff, that sum is itself drawn from a Gaussian distribution. So Neil in the 90s, he was trying to relate things that were happening in the statistical inference and Bayesian inference community to things that were happening in the neural network community. He showed that f of x is Gaussian distributed on functions. This uh, lingo is that it's drawn from a Gaussian process. Remember that a Gaussian is the bell curve. This is the most famous distribution in statistics. It's the famous bell curve. Since then, though, this basic thing that happens in Neil's work this is just adding a bunch of things. Adding a bunch of things happens all the time in neural networks. And therefore, you would expect that many, many architectures have some n goes to infinity limit, where uh, effectively the statistics of the neural network are different Gaussian. So I think this is one of the most two, one of the two most important works from results from neural network theory from the last time. 
Uh, another way to say this is that as n goes to infinity, this one point and two point statistics defines all of the statistics of the world. Um, so uh, in this particular limit, what, one way to say it is that uh, these neural networks that here I'm calling phi have some sort of probability density associated with them of form e to the minus s. This s we call an action in physics, uh, and it's quadratic in these phi's. And there's a particular object appearing here that doesn't matter too much for the purposes of this talk. But this sort of object, this is the sort of thing that Neil guarantees you exists. Uh, this is uh, a Gaussian density on functions, which is what physicists call a generalized free field theory. So if you take in a course on quantum field theory, which is the theory that underlies all particle physics and many other aspects of physics, including condensed matter physics, a free field theory describes uh, uh, particle excitations that don't interact with each other. So particles that just fly by each other without interacting. So there's some sort of connection here between neural network theory and theoretical physics, and it begs for physicists all sorts of questions. So if a neural network is somehow some sort of free field theory, you might ask, how do I get interactions in theory? Are there one over n correction turn on interactions? Because this property is coming explicitly from the n goes to infinity. Um, maybe just to restate it, uh, there's a correspondence going on here that is more general. So uh, let me put it in language that uh, is sort of statistical mechanical. And you're not going to do it the normal way. I'm going to leave this as a general expectation now. The partition function, or uh, I won't call it Feynman packet over now, the partition function associated with this ensemble of functions. There's some sort of ensemble of, fu of functions defined by this expectation value. It's an expectation or some ensemble of e to the uh, j of x phi of x. In statistics language, this is the moment generating function. And the way that you generate the moments with this moment generating function is you hit this with d by dj's, d by dj's, pull down phi's, and they compute the moments of the distribution after you set j to zero. So this is a standard thing in static, it's a standard thing in field theory, it's a standard thing in statistics. And I left it general because I want to be agnostic about where the statistics come from. Feynman, it's fun to do this here, right here. Feynman taught us how to do this. Feynman taught us that one way to think about this, this expectation over some space of functions, is to do a Euclidean path interval, to do the so called Feynman path interval, where basically all this, this is the same object here, appearing here. All he says is that you compute this expectation by integrating over some space of fields. Uh, of some probability density on fields and some form of the minus s. So that's what Feynman taught us. But what the neural network people are teaching us is something different. But there's a different way to think about this expectation. Remember that there's parameters in all of these neural networks, and these parameters come with some probability. So instead of completing Feynman's way, an alternative way to think about this is to compute uh, the way that ML people do, which is instead of having an action and integrating against it, to integrate against P of theta. The probability of density. Oh, kind of yes. one, despite where we are, despite your emphasis on rigor, is generally not rigorously defined. Mm -hmm. Whereas the last one is because it's a finite dimensional interval. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we talked about this yesterday. This is indeed where many mathematicians would complain. Um, and they would say that uh, there simply is no. not a vague measure that makes sense of this whole thing. Uh, there's a Kevin Costello is a well-known mathematical physicist and a mathematician at Perimeter. He wrote this whole book where he goes on a rant for the first chapter about how this thing does not exist. And nevertheless, he's going to use it because physicists have been so good at using it. So that's absolutely true. Um, if you put this on a lattice, which is the normal physicist pop out, um, you do make this thing rigorous because it's just the joint distribution on a finite number of random variables. But indeed, in the continuum, um, it's not necessarily rigorous. Where indeed this is. No, it's kind of analogous to a lattice. It is, but this is continuous. This is finite in statistics and continuous in functions. The lattice is uh, uh, not continuous. Yes, yeah. it's analogous in a certain way. That's right, but it's a different discretization. Okay, so this is something that I've been very excited about for the last few years. Uh, Anandina, who is my former PhD student, she's now a postdoc at Berlin, and did her PhD on this. It's very exciting. We have a bunch of results. Maybe I'll just mention them quickly. We systematically understand interactions. So the non-interacting nature of the field theory is coming from the central limit. And so if in this context, you want interactions, you have to violate one of the assumptions of the central limit. Infinite n is one assumption. 
Statistical independence is another assumption, and statistical identicalness of the thing you're summing is also another one of the assumptions. So you can violate any of those given interactions. We also understand symmetries. We understand how to compute the action in principle, although it's hard in practice sometimes. We know how to get by four theory. This is like the first interacting field theory, even though we're part of field theory one. We understand how to get this as a real network field theory, and we're working on CFT right now. Yes. One question. Yeah. Last slide. Yes. Where do you introduce this peak theta? Um, yeah. Go, go back one second. Yes. This peak theta. Uh, what's the motivation behind it? Can't be added like in direction term to the exponential of some uh, all the doing. Yes. So, so you're asking, can't you add something up here? Yeah. Yeah. So there's a couple of ways to introduce interactions. One is going to phi theta n. If you introduce something up here that depends on phi theta, it depends explicitly on theta, and you can you can interpret it as a deformation of the parameter density. And that deformation of the parameter density breaks in general, breaks statistical independence, and therefore violates one of the assumptions of the second limit, which is why it's a So this is some sort of marriage of machine learning theory and field theory. Any other questions? We have one more story. Maybe an interesting time. Any questions on field theory? Let me be a little brief for the next one. Let me tell you what string theorists don't tell you about Kalani Yaman. Maybe they're a preference one. How many of you have heard of Kalani Yaman, please? Okay, wow, well, most people. So this is one of the central objects in Brian Green's book, The Elevated Universe. It's one of the things many people in this room have spent a lot of their careers studying. A Kalanian manifold is a solution of string theory of a particular set of assumptions that some people like and some people don't, but it's a solution of the theory. And the low energy physics, when we go from 10 dimensions to four dimensions, the low energy physics, this is a two-dimensional projection that you get the idea. The low energy physics depends on the geometry of the topology. And one of the things we do with string theorists is compute the geometry of the topology and therefore the implications for low energy physics. But this comes from somewhere, and it, I, I use the word miraculous quite literally. I think this is a pretty miraculous theorem because it relates something, it, it seems like you sort of get something for free. So what Yao did is he said, consider a, consider a, a manifold of smooth space. Suppose that it's complex and not real. And there's something called Kalin that doesn't matter to itself. So let it be a complex Kalin manifold. What, what Yao showed is that if a certain topological feature holds, you get a geometric result. Topology and geometry are different. So if you can do a topological check to get a geometrical result, that's the sense in which this theorem is miraculous. And uh, what the geometric result is, is that there exists a unique Ricci flat K metric, which is just lingo for the Ricci tensor, which is some sort of contracted curvature tensor that measures the curvature on the manifold, but it's Ricci flat, Rij is zero. So that's Yao's miraculous theorem. We know of many, many, many astronomically large numbers of manifolds that satisfy this topological property, and therefore for which a metric is guaranteed to exist. But the thing that string theorists don't advertise, that I will advertise now, is that zero metrics for compact X are known. So if you're interested in doing a string compactification from 10 dimensions to four dimensions of this type, zero of these metrics are known. And the problem is, is that even in some sense, the, this blessing of the miraculous theorem is also a curse because you do the topological check, but that doesn't, it guarantees the existence of the metric, but it doesn't actually tell you how to construct it. And 40 years in or 30 years in, or however it's long, how long about this? I think this theorem is from the 77th, late 70s, early 80s. That many years in, there are no known compact quality metrics other than the choice, which is trivial. So I don't even know. Okay. So this is the thing that we don't tell you, and it invites uh, some work that's going on in this community uh, that is not my work. This is uh, neural network columbia metrics. So let me uh, explain to you what people do. Um, so basically, what the above authors do is they say, I want to let the neural network be the metric. The, 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 the neural network is a function, so you can make, turn it into a function with two indices, so it's like a metric that's measuring distances on some space. And those parameters in the function serve as a variational ansatz for the metric. So I have gij of x instead of just, uh, instead of, uh, sorry, G I, gij of x picks up some thetas that are the parameters in the variational ansatz. 
And what people do is they optimize the parameters to minimize some objective that drives the metric towards this Ricci flat property. And as you get closer and closer to that Ricci flat property, because the, the metric is unique, you're pretty confident that you're actually converging to the metric that you care. It's worth saying for a broad audience, if you have been, if you're a condensed matter physicist, this is the same type of thing that people do for the quantum many by the wave function. When you have a quantum mechanical system or allows with spins with long distance interactions and things like that, in many different cases, um, it's generally hard to find the ground state. So another way to do that, instead of solving to the metric, you could say, let the wave function be represented by the neural network, and then just try to minimize the energy and try to get as close to the ground state as you can. That's an idea of Carleno and Schroeder from 2017 in the context. They're basically different physics applications of the same basic idea that neural networks are powerful and therefore use them as a variational ensemble for something we care about. The reason that this is a good idea is because of the universal approximation theorems. And the upshot of some of these works is that 15 minutes on a laptop is about equivalent to 30 years of conventional techniques. There's an algorithm, Peter Donaldson, that uh, is guaranteed to converge to the quality of metric, but is slow in practice. So state-of-the-art neural networks, uh, Calabial metrics are approximated by neural networks. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, I think I can explain this in eight minutes and then take a few questions. So if we can approximate the neural network, the Calabial metrics by a neural network, we have some variational ensembles. There's some flow in this parameter space that is inducing some flow in the space of metrics. So when we think about flows in the metric space, there's some metric due to Calabi and Yao that we're trying to converge towards, and some randomly initialized neural network is up here somewhere in parameter space, and we have, uh, by the techniques developed by my friends, some neural network metric flow, if you let me call it that, where there's some, some objective that they're trying to optimize that is designed to drive it to the Ricci flat. So there's, given some initial neural network, there's some metric flow towards the Calabi network. Um, if you restart your computer, you'll start at a different point in the parameter space, and therefore you'll have a different initial neural network that is in principle going towards the clocking output. And you could do it again, and <laughs> oops, animation bug. Uh, you could start at a different point and it would converge towards the clocking output. And then you might ask the question, I got this question a lot when I was explaining it to people. These Calabial metrics are fixed points of this flow. These are where they, this is one place where they end. But there's a famous <laughs> bit of work due to Hamilton in the, in the 80s, which is called Ricci flow. This is a very beautiful genome. The Ricci tensor is a fundamental object on any reality of Hamilton. It's one of these things that measures curvature. And basically, what Hamilton said up to this back in the two, which he added for historical reasons, is that he wants to consider flows in the space of metrics so that the geometry is evolving such that the metric is being updated proportional to the Ricci tensor. And then when you look at this equation, the ricci flat condition, which is that Rij is zero, clearly this very famous Ricci flow in the math literature is related to the Calabi energy. When you look at this, you might say, are these secretly the same thing? And on one hand, um, you might hope that that's the case, but when you look at this, this is, this is the gradient of some scalar objective function, some scalar loss function, Whereas here, it's just the Ricci tensor appearing in the hands. Um, what Perelman had, Perelman had a famous idea. I mentioned him earlier. He was uh, the person that proved the Poincare injection, this thing that relates spheres to each other, how, how spherity is a thing that looks like a sphere. Uh, he proved the Poincare conjecture in three dimensions in the 2000s. And crucially, he uh, demonstrated that this Ricci flow admits some sort of transformation. In which it becomes, uh, in which it becomes a, a gradient flow, and therefore emits an interpretation of this complex. So, I'm a little behind on time, and I want to focus on taking questions. But all I'll tell you is that there's a very famous. I told you about neural network statistics. There's a very, very famous theory of neural network dynamics called the neural tanning kernel, in about 2018 or 2017, and we applied it in this context to develop a theory of metric flows. That uh, uh, for how the neural network theoretically, how, how the neural network metric is flowing as you update it. And the equation basically looks like this, which looks like some complicated thing. On the other hand, Perelman's formulation looks much simpler. There's no integral, there's fewer indices on this, on, uh, on this tensor compared to this tensor. This involves some sort of complicated mixing. This is this thing from the NL theory literature adapted to this case. And so a priori, this simply does not look like this. But what you can do 
this there's these architecture choices that you can make a functional form of the neural network that lets you restrict the problem to be able to do large language to be able to do images in this case to be able to reproduce Perelman and you can make choices to go from this general theory to this theory here that is Perelman's so the, the summary of the result from this paper is that the theory of flows in the space of metrics governed by neural networks this is really doing machine learning theory for geometry there's some general story and then there's a limit that you can take that uses the ML theory to resolve. And there's a way of getting rid of the interval. And then if on top of that, you let the objective function be the one that Perelman here would use, you can, use, you can, you can get Perelman's Ricci flow, this thing that he used to prove the Poincaré conjecture in this much broader context of neural network metric flows. So this got a little technical at the end. So all I'll say is that this uh, is where state-of-the-art Calabia metrics live. Uh, my friends have come up with a way to do better for numerically approximating Galadiel metrics than anyone else. And it lives out here in theory space, whereas Perelman lives here. But we now understand this and we understand this happening. So in conclusion, I told you about rigor from applied ML, conjecture generation can lead to new theorems, a rigorous verification can be used to tackle problems that can be gamified, use reinforcement learning to tackle these problems. And the, ruled out over 800 potential counterexamples to the sum of 40 Poincaré conjecture. We use the theory of neural network statistics to relate it to field theory and develop a new way to do field theory and also a way to understand neural networks. And finally, we have geometric flows coming from gradient descent uh, that used uh, results from neural network theories and neural network dynamics uh, and then compass parallel dimension flow. More broadly, I really think, uh, sort of something I have to tell my students, if you, Look at the history of computer science, which some might like, attribute back to Babbage and Lovelace in the 1800s or something like that, and famously during the 40s. And every generation has its, of us alive, uh, has something that has happened in computer science as a part of their generation that has changed the world. And I think it's just obvious that from a historical time scale, we're really at the beginning of computer science. We're not, we think of it as 50 years in, but on like a 500 year time scale, we're at the beginning. We're lucky enough to be in the beginning. And one of the things that people are asking more and more is how do we think about computer science in the service of science? Whether you're thinking about traditional techniques or AI and ML or quantum computing, CS for science is going to lead to enormous results. I think. One thing that's happening now is AI for science. And when you're thinking about AI for science and how these techniques can be error prone in the ways that I've shown you, you simply have to think about rigor because whether we're scientists trying to control error bars on experiments or numerical approximations in the last field theory, or alternatively with theorists on the map at the end of the spectrum who want exact results and rigor means zero error, we, if we want to do AI for science, we have to be able to do that. But I don't think there's any of this. So that's all I wanted to say. Sorry, I got a little technical at the end, but I'll take questions and we'll be able to do that. Thanks. Thank you, Jim. We have uh, time for three questions. Um, so it kind of came up on the, the one of your last slides, but in Perlman's formulation of Ricci flow yes. uh, as a gradient flow, there's an important role played by a scalar function. Yeah. Being diloton graphic. That's right. Can you comment on what the interpretation of that would be in this particular context? Right. So technically, um, what Perlman what Perelman does is he does a time dependent dithyomorphism of Hamilton's Ricci flow that takes it to his gradient flow functional. Mm -hmm. uh, his scalar loss functional is Einstein's Deleton gravity. Mm -hmm. And so, if you actually want to implement that on a computer, you need to pass from your metric to a metric plus a Deleton and then you do a Yeah. Okay. Is there, is there any interesting interpretations about the Deleton in the world network case, or is it just what it is? You would just need an extra component. Um, as you know, there's connections between information theory and what Perelman did, so you might want to look at that context. But I don't know. Very good. Okay, thanks. Yes. Uh, back in part one of your talk, you mentioned the state of the art ribbon solver. Yes. Uh, can you say anything more about how that's working? Like, is it trying band additions or something like that? Yeah, that's exactly what it's doing. It's taking a representation of the model on the computer and it's trying band additions. The, move, the fundamental move there is way, I mean, it's actually kind of complicated because if you end up with these. Let's see how quickly I can get back there. Wow, that's pretty fast, actually. Okay, so if you have these really complicated knots, basically what we could do is cut open a little interval here and route the band through the knot and connect it somewhere else and then try to see. That's, that's the nature of the game. But so I was wondering, I guess, at, at 70 crossing or something like that, doesn't the number of possible bands explode? Um, it, it does, but you're doing the addition step by step. The number of, uh, the number of possible bands ex explodes, but you're doing it in a step by step fashion. 
So um, not a perfect analogy, but um, you know, the intermediate stages of the band division means that your state space is exploding. But this is actually where reinforcement really succeeds. So in, in Go, there's 10 of 172 possible board positions, even though there's only like 19 times 19 places you can place the stones. And so when the action space is small, but the state space is enormous, that's where reinforcement really is. It's pretty good at that. Yeah. 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 You said during the beginning that it rigorous results from ML we should ask for exact results. And I'm That's not sure what you meant. It. I was going to object. Yes. Because we can imagine, say, using a probabilistic method for minimizing a loss function and be able to make a statement that the generalization error is less than, you know, some small amount with high probability. Yes. And that would be a rigorous statement. Yes. And but then I wasn't sure what you meant when you were talking about Ritchie flow, because were you you know, you had some statement about approximating the Ritchie Blatt um, metric on the Allow the Yow space, and you were satisfied with that as a rigorous result. Let me, I, in that context, the empirical things, we shouldn't necessarily be satisfied with doing these rigorous results yet. What I was saying is that the theoretical part of that, where we're developing the theory behind it, the theory is just solid and equation based. The actual numerical implementation of Colladia metrics gets you to a place where it's close to Ritchie Blatt. And then something that someone actually in the, in the ML and math meeting here is known for doing in a different context is getting close to a solution to a PDE and using the neural network representation to prove that there's an actual solution nearby. So that would be the rigorous step to go from the empirics to the rigorous result. What I meant in the ML theory applied to Ricci plus setup is that the theoretical aspect is rigorous. The empirical bits on Calabria metrics are still not rigorous. And certainly regarding your first point regarding probabilistic control over losses and so forth, Definitely in many contexts, controlled approximation and controlled error bars are something that is one notion of what rigorous means. So there are some breakthroughs happening in lattice field theory of new ways of coming up in, in the Markov chain with the with a new proposal for accept reject using ML techniques that basically beats down the auto correlations. And that's a situation in which they're using a notion of rigor. Yes, it's rigorous in the infinite statistics limit because there are control error, controllable error lines. So there's different notions of rigor that we should be clear. Yeah. The question uh, comes to the uh, most part. Yeah. So uh, you're using the enforcement methods in turning into games. I guess when you have the notes, you reward the key agents for actually actually unlinking yes. the thing. Yeah. But did you reward something in this step as well or punish them to be a There's different versions that we try. One thing that we generally try in certain contexts, you, you can always reward at end of game and you should. That's something that's called sparse reward in machine learning. You, you don't get it for a while. Uh, but something you can do if you have some sort of bias that shortening the knot is getting you closer to the end knot, um, then you can reward based on that as well. Part of the problem is that there are no knot, no representations of knots that you have to make it bigger to be able to make it smaller. Um, so you, there, are, there are known cases where in certain representations of the data, you can't go straight to zero. You have to go up to the end. So that's why you might not want to reward it in any of the steps. We do both in practice. So it's sort of it can be expected to be less efficient from the reward the effect, but it's still possible to achieve it. Um, you can do either case, it's a choice, and this is called sort of reward engineering, and it's actually kind of a dream business, and there's not really a systematic theory on it. Yeah. Um, in the matrix plus case, actually the question here on the book with the matrix, right? So yes, that's right. Um how do you the neural network itself is a dependent on other variables? So it's a continuous function of say that then how do you actually break that in the matrix? Uh, yeah, so it's a continuous function that's symmetric with two indices. So it's a symmetric in two rank two tensor mm -hmm. uh, that depends on parameters. Mm -hmm. And there's various ways you start it as a metric and you're restricting something called the degree, the degree study metric. But that's basically the story. It has two indices. So it's not a scalar function anymore. It's a symmetric rank two tensor that depends on and actually, that's not my idea. That's the people that did this in the first place. I may ask a uh, sort of preloaded question. So, if you were to speculate on greatest success in the next five, 10 years, um, what would be your bet? Oh, that's a hard to speculate on. Um, I mean, I guess. For mathematics or interaction with physics? I mean, I'm certainly, my personal bias is that I love this field theory stuff. 
And so I want ways to think about conformal field theories in this context and get new conformal field theories that we don't know yet. I would consider that a great success. Um, to John's question, one thing that would be very useful is if mathematicians who are interested in really finding Kalabian metrics could take these Kalabian cases and um, and prove that there's nearby solutions in the same way that Javier has a little system or something like that, that would be really useful. Uh, but I, I think those are interesting directions and uh, any of those would be major results, but um, you know, it's sort of context dependent depending on where we're going. Yes, yeah, it's part of the second thing. Sure, it's a good thing. I don't know if you want to put that. Thanks for the question. Yeah, based on the nature that we've got working on the field right now, one of the things that you're doing is exactly the project. What do you mean by open? You have to do the No, 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 exactly, exactly. So, um, yeah, as you know, yeah, I've spoken to people in all that question. I have a colleague in the books, one that comes to me, and I'm really excited about it. That's about it. It's a process. Indeed, there she, by rigor, she just moved into the other chain and she's just about it. It was just a bit. Does it mean getting robust with it? Yeah, great. Good. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah, that's what I was to you to get it. Yes, yes, yes. I said, well, it's definitely a good question. You mean it's not a model, we're, we're trying to apply a CFT where, like, on theoretical grounds, we have a CFT that we can then do numerically instead of, I mean, Blue Shop, as I understand it, is, is numerical search for CFTs via uh, setting up your program. And so, um, we're using something called the embedding program. Are you familiar with this? Uh, it's in like the Cobb's life. Yeah. In, in general, from D dimensions to D plus two, because the conformal group in D dimensions is, is, is the real group in D plus two. Yes. Um, and so, basically, the idea is to um, start a Euclidean with rotate of the Lorentzian theory at D plus two theory and then push down to the CFT and all the metrics. And so, um, using this neural network field theory idea. So, this neural network field theory idea is just a different way to define a field theory. But if I can define it, it gets control over the symmetries in exactly the way required by the embedding formalism. Then, when I push down to two dimensions, I'm done. Uh, uh, you are automatically computing positive uh, symmetry in terms of all. Good. So, these theories aren't necessarily unitary, they have to satisfy extra constraints to be unitary. Are you um, familiar with reflection positivity? Uh, I think okay, good. so reflection positivity is a constraint on Euclidean correlators that's necessary if you unitary in the after violation. And uh, in general, these things don't satisfy that. So they're not necessarily unitary. Remind me, to get crossing symmetry in the CFT, right? I think I need to unitary, right? Uh, it, it's the issue of the crossing symmetry, but uh, non unitary. So okay. it's basically a hard thing. Uh, six by uh, these two at the, uh, the same time. Yeah. So in conform bootstrap, what we usually do is that we have a uh, so that's the same conformism, we, we inherit from crossing, but for building uh, conform symmetry, uh, building uh, uh, unitary design, we, we check crossing. Right, because you're, you're um... I mean, you're, you're studying theories that satisfy the unitary ground. Yes, yes. Right. When you do your study. Right. Um, right. So, in this other case, uh, in this other case, you can choose the scale of dimensions to be such that they don't satisfy the unitary ground. It's still get conformal field theories that are statistically correct. Right. Um, 
Um, but then it's interesting, it's another question that you can make choices to remove infections. So, um, but the key thing in this context is that in this context, we're defining a CFT by a theory with correlation functions that satisfy the symmetries that CFTs do. Um, and that's a very broad context that if you then add unitarity, um, that uh, that constrains the theory. Of the most, I mean, to my definition, the most, I, I, more than one of the most definition, uh, most general definition that I know of in the CFT is the theory of the correlation function that satisfies the necessary symmetries. And that doesn't necessarily mean that. But, but indeed, it's not the numerical technique isn't coming first, the theory is coming first when we're doing like this Euclidean B plus two to the right side B plus two pushed down by the CFT, which that you know about, right? Yeah. I have a question with the NFC. So here you use CFT with the NFC. That's right, that's right. Well, yeah, so by the this so called embedding formalism, the crucial thing in the embedding formalism is to realize that the conformal group in D dimensions is the Lorentz group in D plus two dimensions. And so if you can do that, if you can get the Lorentz group in D plus two dimensions and then push down, you get the CFT in D dimensions from the higher dimension. So what was the biggest like, lock? I'm sorry, I don't lock this one. I 